I am Sleepy Reader, a.k.a. Damien, and I have, as a special guest, my favorite comic book podcaster, <laughs> Eric Longbox Review. Eric from Longbox Review. That's He's right. Got a, uh, you've got a web page and a, a, a vlog, and, I, and a podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, you do post some... St- Sorry, I, I'm not even letting you talk. <laughs> Say hey, hi to the folks. Eric. It's your show. Hey, everybody. <laughs> hey, Damon. Thanks for thanks for uh, in, uh, inviting me to join you to talk about the the topic that I'll let you introduce. Since it's your show. <laughs> yeah, we're today we're going to talk about the first six issues of Aerosmith by um, Kurt Busiak and is it Carlos? Mm-hmm. I've forgotten his first name. Carlos Pacheco. Uh, with Inker Marino, I've forgotten his first name. Hey, <laughs> the Seuss. credits aren't on the first page here, are they? Where are mm, they? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so yes, Kurt Busiak, writer, Carlos Pacheco, pencil artist, inks by Jesus Marino, color, which I think is an important person to mention, mm-hmm. by Alex Sinclair, and lettering by Richard Starkings and his comic craft company. Yeah. Um, and. Originally, this all started for us when you posted that you had gotten all six issues on Twitter. Mm -hmm. And I was like, hey, I bought all six issues about a year ago and never read it. (laughs) Maybe (laughs) I can force myself to read it, so to speak, (laughs) So by by doing a crossover with Eric. And and then we get to hang out together, too. That's right. That's right. Which is the, the, the... You know, the, talking about the comic book is just an excuse to, for us to hang out. So exactly, and talk com <laughs> any talking comics is good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I'm curious, Damien, since you said you you bought this uh, series about a year ago, what was it that drew you to it? What? Why did you buy those issues? I think I had this first issue back when it came out, and I don't think it made a huge impression on me. Mm. But also, I was at a time when I only went to comic book stores randomly back then. And then uh, I was on quite a, I was on a tight budget, I think, at this point, and I was mostly reading trades from the library. So oh. probably, if I'd stumbled across the trade at the library, I would have picked it back up. But but I remember kind of loving the art and being intrigued by the story. Mm-hmm. And now, having read all six issues, I can see why the first issue didn't quite, um, you know, cause me to rush back to the comic book store. Yeah, uh, but I also was in a phase where I just was, you know. Now I go to the comic book store every Wednesday, and I'm looking around. What else can I get? More comics, more comics. But back then I wasn't. And so then when I uh, my shop does a lot of uh, bundling, you know, they'll bundle up six a whole arc or a whole series, <clears throat> and sell it for a pretty good price. So when I saw them all together, hmm. and thought, uh, oh, I don't have to go searching for individual issues. I, I thought, oh, yeah, I've always wanted to read that. So I picked it up. Interesting. So it's fascinating because you and I have a somewhat similar story, or at least uh-huh. at least some some details are similar because um, uh, I, I did not see the first issue like in a comic shop or anything. But I was I think I was vaguely aware of it. So this, you know, because this came out. Uh, uh, sept- so the cover dates are September 2003 right. through May 2004. So, you know, we're talking. We're talking summertime of 2003 when when the single issues were the first few single issues were coming out, um, and and then what I remember uh, because well I think because it was Kurt Busiek and uh, Carlos Pacheco from Avengers Forever, uh huh, and I think that's where I first became aware of their collaboration. And because of that, uh, you know, maybe reading uh, trade magazines, uh, what was it, uh, Wizard back then, Wizard magazine, uh-huh. right? Wizard probably was the big one. And and because uh, I wasn't around that time, I was actually just kind of getting back into buying a lot of different comics because uh, in the late '90s, early 2000s, I was I w- I had very few titles that I was subscribed to at my comic book shop. Because I was in, uh, I was finishing up grad school at that time. Right. So you were have... both busy and poor, probably. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So um, there's a lot of things that I missed during that time period. Um, but I remember in uh, in 2004, seeing the the trade collection in a uh, at, at, in uh, the local mall where I live, a Walden uh-huh. Books, 
for people that remember ah, that, those good that old Jane. Walden books days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I, and I saw that cause uh, you know, that was the only bookstore that had any, any sizable uh, comic book presence um, in, at least in my area. Right. And, and I saw this trade on, on their shelf. I'm like, Oh, I really, I, you know, it's Busick, it's Pacheco Avengers forever. This has got to be good. I flipped through it. Um, you know, when I was in the store, but you know, whatever the price was back then, uh, for that, for that trade is like, well, I don't really have the money for that. I'll, I'll just kind of wait until I, until I have a little extra money or whatever. And right. I, you know, and whenever we were at the mall, I'd always want to stop in and see what's at the Walden books. And I'd still see that, that, that darn trade. I'm like, oh, it's calling to me. I want to <laughs> read this, you know, just because the, pre the, the premise of this, well, I, and I'm sure you'll get into that in just a second, but the premise of it was like, this sounds really cool. Yeah. And, and then, uh, there was a point where I, I finally went back. I decided, okay. I got, I've, I got a few extra bucks. I'm going to go buy that, that, uh, that darn trade. And I go the next time we go to the mall, I go to that, I go to Walden books and guess what? Uh, not there anymore. It's not there. <laughs> and then I just kind of forgot about the series, you know, off and on for the next 15 or so mm -hmm. years. And then when I signed up for the DC universe app, the D now, now known as DC universe infinite, I don't, I don't know why they needed right. to add that infinite on there, but, uh, Some important corporate decision. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but they had that, um, or they had the first two issues on the app and I'm uh, like, Oh yeah, I wanted to read this. So I read it and I'm like, Oh my God, this is, you know, this is beautiful. This is a beautiful comic book. And I kept waiting for that because I thought, okay, because that was at the time that the, the the DC Universe app, they were slowly bringing out or, or releasing their titles. And sometimes you'd get a few issues and then, you know, a few weeks later or a few months later, you'd get a few more issues. And they never released the, the other four issues. And in fact, I, this morning, before we got on here, I checked to make sure. And it's still just the two, wow. the first two. What are they thinking? I know, right? It's it, it must be some sort of weird rights issue, even though DC owns that imprint that you know, right. they bought that imprint that what wait, what is this? Wildstorm. Uh, Wildstorm. Wildstorm. Yeah. Jim Lee it was Jim Lee's uh imprint that he spun off from Image and then he eventually sold to DC to get himself a nice job at DC, I guess. <laughs> and hopefully a nice uh it's, it's retirement out for him. fund too. <laughs> He's He's, he's the only survivor in the endless mm. uh, cuts at DC, isn't he? Mm -hmm. But that's that's neither here nor there. And that's interesting that it's still up there because, in fact, now Aerosmith has finally come back and it's being published by Image Comics. Mm -hmm. And I, in my foolishness, I just went ahead and read this first issue from Image before going back and reading Aerosmith, ah. just because I do my weekly review show and I wanted to review it with the rest of them. Um, and in a weird way, I think uh, reading this helped me get into the, so reading this first issue of the second arc, you know, which is what, uh, almost 20 years later, 18 years later, mm -hmm. uh, it helped me get into the uh, make a smoother transition, ironically, into the <laughs> original story. That is so weird. You know, coming coming into a sequel series to get yeah. you into the mood to read the, <laughs> to read the, the 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 original one. I mean, I I remembered <laughs> a few details from having read it mm -hmm. eighteen, having read one issue eighteen years ago. I knew the basic premise that it was World War II with dragons and magic. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then I kind of picked up on stuff. So if you're, if people are wondering, you could start reading Aerosmith with the new arc, which is called Behind Enemy Lines. Mm -hmm. However, I think it is richer to read to read these first six ones now that I yeah, read. Them. Yeah, because you get the introduction to the characters, to the world, right? Uh, and it's World War One. I. I think you said World War Two earlier, but did I? Oh, I'm sorry, sorry. I yeah. meant World War One. Yeah. And and so that you know, like I said, that that the that the the premise of this book. Uh, that that whole idea of it being set during World War One. So we're, we're talking. I think it, the, it starts in 1915. Um, but but with all these supernatural creatures, the the magic in the world, you know, just that whole idea just really it sounds really really cool. Right. And um, well, while we're talking about that setup, then what you start to realize, and it depending maybe on your experience as a science fiction reader, you may pick up on this quicker or slower, is this is, it's not just magic overlaid across our history. 
This is an alternate history, mm -hmm. presumably affected by, by the fact that there's magic. So there is no United States of America. Right. Um, there are, uh, and there is no Germany. It's Prussia and some other countries. Mm -hmm. um, so Germany never united. I'm presuming that the American Revolution never happened. And eventually the different colonies formed into different uh, countries. Because there's, what is there, the United States of Colombia or something like that, that our right. hero comes from? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that... And that, and they say that he lives in Connecticut, but he lives by one of the Great Lakes. So yeah. things are really different. <laughs> Very different. Yeah, yeah. I was that. That was one of the nice things. I don't know if we want to get into this part just yet, but in the back of issue was it issue one, Damien? One or and two, two have maps. Um, one, I think, of America or what we call uh, America. You're, I think, no. Issue one is Europe. Oh, is it issue and, one Europe? Yeah, and then oh, issue, right. two is, and is issue two is United. Yeah, the United States of Colombia, yeah. and yeah, you see, it is so bizarre to see. I'll so put there, my overhead camera on. Okay. But yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, Connecticut is like this really thin state across uh, the area. Um, Massachusetts has like three different areas broken up by the by the one of the Great Lakes. It just, it's just it's just fascinating how this stuff right uh, was was conceived of and 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 shown. Yeah, I'm not sure what he's thinking when Connecticut. I mean, I always think of Connecticut as being named after the Connecticut River, but I'm not sure if the Connecticut River is in this Connecticut. <laughs> See, I didn't even know there was a Connecticut River. So, yeah. So that was an Indian name, and it was the Connecticut River. Ah, okay. And they named the state of Connecticut because I I grew up in Connecticut. I mean, I'm ah, not expecting right. everyone in all 50 states to know that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so since we're talking about this stuff uh, in particular, uh, there is a name that uh, we left off earlier as one of the, uh, I'll just say creators, more of a consultant, but that's Lawrence Watt Evans. Oh, very good point. I forgot about him. Who is credited as the Alternity Consultant. Right. And uh, you may know about uh, Mr. Watt Evans more than I, um, given your science mm -hmm. fiction background. I have not read any of his novels. I've read some of his short stories. And um, he was a popular for a while. I don't think he's that popular now. Um, science fiction writer. And um, I don't recall if he was... There was a huge boom in the 90s, I think. I think it was the 90s of all these alternate history um, books. And maybe he was one of the people who wrote them. Yes. Um, yeah, and in fact, uh, oh, did you look him up? Or? One of one of the one of the novels. Uh, uh, so I have this. I found an interview with Kurt Busick uh, on uh, CBR from many years ago. I don't remember when oh, exactly, cool. but anyway, uh, he mentions Watt Evans uh, consulting with Watt Evans to come up with the backstory. You know the divergence, uh, the, the divide, divergent events of of our history, our our real history. Mm -hmm to come up with this alternative world that Aerosmith is set in. And right. um, so let's see here. He says, um, uh, see, uh, I've been talking, this is from Busick. I've been, uh, I've been talking with my friend, Lawrence Watt Evans, the fantasy novelist, when he was casting around for the subject of a big sprawling fantasy epic, I suggested that he do something with biplane pilots as wizards. He went somewhere else with a suggestion, taking the idea of new magical technologies and turning it into his novel, Touched by the Gods. So I took the rest of the idea back, combining it with the other bit about a shared universe of fantasy and fairy tales, and Carlos Pacheco and I shaped it and built it into Aerosmith. Ah, so in a sense, they collaborated on some, you know, brainstorming, and mm -hmm. each went off and did a different thing. So here's the map of Europe. We've got Prussia. Troilia slash Hungary, France is Gallia, Castile, Lusitania. <clears throat> I guess uh, Spain is, excuse me, <clears throat> Spain is not united either. Castile and Aragon, A Aragon, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it right. <clears throat> Sorry, ah, morning throat. Um, so if you study European history, there was a series of unifications, right? Mm. Um, Germany was one of the last countries in our world to unify into one country. And that, that may be part of the political trouble with Germany that these two wars centered around <laughs> them. I used to know 
I used to know a lot more about this. <laughs> mm. I took a course on what they called modern European history, which was mostly the 1800s um, when I was in college. It, it ended, their their version of modern European history when I was in college ended at World War I. Mm. <laughs> but so there's a whole series of the politics of various countries that are trying to form into larger countries um, that played a big role in uh, World War I. Well, you know far more about it than I do. <laughs> yeah, but but I just have vague memories now. Um, unfortunately, I, I slept through my uh, my uh, European history class. Uh -huh. If if I even had one, I don't even <laughs> remember. <laughs> right. Well, I was I was almost I almost had a minor in history. I took so many history courses. So it's hmm. sad that I can't remember the finer details anymore. Just the general impressions. Um. <clears throat> so one assumes from the little bit of evidence and the little bit of what's left in my memory that he probably had researched a lot of uh, your, the early modern European history to put this together. Well, really early because uh, uh, music goes on, uh, explains a little bit more. Oh, that, you so. have a source of info. There, so yes. uh, he says, Watt Evans helped us create the history of it, working out what changed and why in the years since the peace of Charlemagne in wow. 800 AD. Wow. So he really went back. Yeah. Uh, which country survived, which died, which royal lines married into which, what happened to the mercantile empires, and on and on. It all fits together and makes logical sense. Um, uh, though I credit Lawrence uh, with it way more than me. So we hope to tell stories set in the history of the world as well as following the development of the war. With any luck, it'll be as much fun for the readers as it is for us. Fun is an interesting word when you're talking mm. about war. Exactly, right? <laughs> Especially the arc of this particular six-issue series. Right, and right. The, so, and Fletcher Aerosmith, the, the main character. Yeah, so as we were saying before we started recording, this series has a very clear arc, issue to issue, and the six issues of a, well, I would call it the, the innocent idealist uh, goes step by step deeper into the horrors of war and the mm -hmm. the moral murkiness of it all, or the ultimately lack of morals of it all, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, at first, he seems like a character right out of some kind of boys' novel, you know, <laughs> writ written in the yes. early twentieth century. Oh, that's you know, perfect. just a plucky, gung ho kid who's gonna do good and and will succeed because he has a good heart an open person yes and uh you know there's bullies along the way and and uh, older people who give him advice and all of that stuff let's see if i can you see well yeah i'm not as good at this as damien is um but you see fletcher there in this one panel uh he's the red-haired boy and just the the look on his face you know he's he's so happy to see these uh these arrow men Oh, there right. we go. Thank you. Right. And there they are all very ideal yes. looking like shining knights, so to speak, flying through the air. Yeah. And there he is in the crowd, the fresh faced boy. Not quite. Blonde. Well, I guess he's blonde, blondish, reddish, strawberry mm -hmm. blonde, maybe. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, yeah. So pretty much your uh, cliched leading hero. And um, and he's a plucky kid who has a grumpy father and an older brother and. Yeah, so so very much, and the the whole tone of it is 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 as if they're doing that kind of story, mm -hmm. right? Um, even the the um, kind of peripheral stuff, like they call it a Challenger picture magazine. It's like this is it's almost like we're picking up an early pulp magazine for young boys to have yes. rousing adventures. I was hoping you'd bring that up because that's one of the things I liked. So that whole idea of, of uh, yeah, what do they, what do they call it? A cliffhanger picture magazine, a, a monthly right. magazine for the adventurer and hero. So the whole, I mean, it, they're getting a little meta with it, you know, because right. uh, they're, they're publishing this comic book, but they're, they're treating it like this, like this other thing. And, and yeah. And, and uh, every issue, except for the first one starts off with this, this uh, recap page. Right. But, but it looks very glamorous and yeah, it's, it's designed to look like something else. And then, and uh, like you saw there in that lower left corner, 
or in the right corner, in the case of that issue you're showing, there's always a few items that uh, Pacheco threw in there mm -hmm. that that pertain specifically to the to the the story of that issue, and it just those kinds of details I, I just I just love because it it creates a much more immersive experience for the story itself or the comic book itself. It's just wonderfully put together this, right. this comic book series. Yeah. Um. And he he uh, he gains kind of a plucky girlfriend, the rich girl who decides to give it all up to go yep. help help out the soldiers on the front by uh, working with the ambulances. And uh, what would you call it? I mean, this is also kind of a familiar character trope, the kind of uh, the Ben Grimm of the story, the grumpy, not quite human, but can relate to our plucky hero kind of character. Uh, I'm trying to remember his name. He's you talking about the troll, the rock troll, rock troll. He's from, um, I forget. I, I don't know what equivalent country he's from, but he's a big Rocky yeah. kind of creature. Well, and that's, he's, that's his name or nickname too, in the story is Rocky. Oh, right. And he's a rock troll. Um, from yeah, Lotharingia. Which okay. I don't know what country that's supposed to be, and he's a follower of old gods, mm. the North gods, in fact, because right. that that does come into it uh, a few right. times a good later point. in the Northern series. Northern gods, so maybe he's a rock troll of Northern Europe. I, I don't know why I got Eastern Europe in my head. So, and then there's, um, I forget the, uh, there's the dashing. I guess that might be in the third issue. The dashing leader of his squadron with the thin mustache and Captain Fox, I think you're Captain referring Fox, to. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess maybe that's not even until later. Yeah. So he's kind of the uh the role model and the the older adult who who uh who also says good things about him all the time and how great mm -hmm. he is and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think he comes in in issue four right. trying to get uh because we're kind of jumping around here, but uh, uh, Fletcher experiences war and 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 what that means and the horrors of it, and he's having a hard time with it, right. and and he's he's basically isolating himself and not, um, uh, not uh, hanging out with his his comrades and 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 uh, so uh, Fox talks to him about that and tries to get him out of his own head and convinces right. him, you know, just go into town. You, you you need to you need to experience life and not just dwell on the death and, and right, destruction right. and and uh just you know the 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 the, 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 the bad aspects well are right. there any are there any good aspects of war i was gonna say. <laughs> so um and, and but it helps him and then uh you know uh later at issue five he uh fox actually rescues fletcher from from being killed and then you know in six gives him some sagely you know mentorly uh older brother type advice you know to help him through the the events of what happens in issue six and then well to totally spoil it um but i think this is i should have said it i'll put in the description spoilers <laughs> right, right um that uh and then finally sacrifices himself mm -hmm. uh for the larger group and up till the very end he's just cool and suave about it yes yes I, in fact, in my notes here, I have Captain Fox is really the hero of this story overall for yes. for those for, for those various reasons. And then, of course, the culminating in his own self-sacrifice to save uh, that uh, what's left of that squadron and, right. and everybody else that's around. So, yeah, that was that was probably the more the most affecting aspect of this to me, mm -hmm. um, uh, aside from the. The descent that Fletcher goes through from right. being that ideal, idealistic young man who wants to go and make a difference um, right. in Europe uh, to to fight the Prussians and the uh, I forget the other country that uh, right they that, that we're talking about unfamiliar name. <laughs> but but and then and then w that's one of the things I like Trillions, about I yes <laughs> the the as we go through each issue from being introduced to the world in issue one issue two they go to New York to join up um issue three i forget now oh they're they're traveling to Europe. they're traveling over across the ocean and right. the ship gets attacked by a nazi sea serpent 
would they, what they call them unter no, They're not called Nazis either. So I don't know. Right. Yeah. They're obviously, but we're, we're in World War One. It would never have been called Nazis anyway. Right. Right. Uh, <clears throat> and then uh, issue four is uh, it's called No Man's Land. Um, so he, you know, get fur further descending into uh, into the war and its its effects on him. Right. Uh, and right. then the fir the first death. Sorry to interrupt, but the no, first death ahead. in issue three is viewed as this noble death that served yes. a purpose and saved everybody. Yeah, right. And then by issue four, his comrades are just being cut down and it's kind of seems like pointless deaths. Mm -hmm. And and then we realize, you know, war is just about a lot of random people dying. Right. Often in ugly ways. That's um, yeah. Like I said, what, 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 what is the yeah. good of war? <laughs> right. There's no justice to it. It's not like yeah. two, two noble knights come out and fight and the one with the pure heart wins the battle and mm -hmm. saves the mm -hmm. day. You know, that's probably one, one <clears throat> criticism I have of this, um, is that we, we never get into the head or see things from the viewpoint of, you know, the other side, the, you know, the quote unquote bad guys. In fact, they refer to them quite often, uh, through various characters as monsters. Right. Um, but I also understand that that's not the story that's being told here. It's just, it's just, you know, this is, we're really seeing the whole thing from Fletcher's point of view. Mm -hmm. So, I, so I understand that, but, uh, it, it does come across a little too one-sided perhaps. Right. Well, but there's begins to be hints. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the next issue, I believe, uh, five is where in a sense they, uh, they're sent out on again, what seems like kind of a noble mission with a new experimental magic thing to throw at the, at the, uh, Prussian lab. Mm -hmm. And instead it burns down the entire city and just destroys all the civilians and everyone. Right. Um, which is essentially like fire bombings that, that we allies did on Germany in mm -hmm. world war two. Mm -hmm. Which is sort of where I start mixing World War II and World War One together a bit in my mind with this. Yeah, I, th um, I think Busick was doing that on purpose <clears throat> to, you know, uh, calling up things that were probably more recent right. in, in memory, and also calling back to things that actually happened uh, in during World War II, so right. that we would have a, a maybe more of a, a way to ground ourselves into in in the the ideas or the story yeah. that he's trying to tell. Well, and and also perhaps you know once you create these airmen and you have magic, you have something a little a little more advanced than the uh, biplanes of right. World War One. That's true. That's true. So and then in in the fifth issue, <clears throat> he starts to realize that the uh, anger of the Prussians in the next conflict. Is because of what he did right and they may have a good point he realizes so there That's is a true. hint yeah that they may not be what he thinks or what he's been taught they are mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well and, and i suppose that's that's a, a compliment to fletcher himself because he is he is uh self-aware right um he's not that he's not just that that former idealized young boy um he he does see things from different perspectives uh, which, you know, uh, they could have gone the other way with the story, obviously, right. but, but, uh, at least we, you're right. You're absolutely right. They, they, we do get a little bit, a tiny, a sliver <laughs> in the first issue. We're so showed this guy, the blood emperor, I think he's called mm -hmm. <clears throat> Rocky tells us about him and he's a dark sorcerer who makes of Troilia and Prussia and Bavaria, his puppets, and he just wants blood and pain and death and misery that he feasts on like a vampire i don't know now by the end of the series if that's true or not <laughs> right that was one of the glaring uh oversights i felt in this story uh was you know propping up this uh, uh the blood emperor as as a real person that right. that that somehow is controlling everything uh from from the the prussian and tyrolean uh perspective Right. Yeah, we never get back to that, and then and then how does that tie into the North gods that we see in the later chapters? Because right. we, right. It, it is suggested heavily that they are real, um, mm -hmm. uh, even though the way it's presented <laughs> uh, in in what was it issue five that um, it could it could just be yeah there we go that you're you're seeing the the, the it panels could just there. be his delusion in the exactly. middle of you know intense conflict mm -hmm. but 
it seems like it's real because we're in a world of magic. He has a special stone that's related to the North gods that his friend Rocky gave him. Right. Um, and Rocky is fighting because of the North gods. That's his reason for fighting. At least in this series. Well, also, uh, uh, in, I think in the first issue, um, you know, Rocky was telling, uh, like you said, Rocky was telling uh, Fletcher about uh, the, the blood, blood emperor God. and and why he came to um, the Colombia from Europe to escape mm -hmm. to escape the the atrocities there. Right. Um, and then Fletcher calls him out on it. How could, how could you not stay and fight for freedom? You know, for whatever. And and that uh, caused uh, a bit of a rift between them until right. later. Until later when Rocky just kind of shows up. Mm -hmm. Excuse me again. <clears throat> Rocky just shows up in Europe having enlisted because he was inspired by Fletcher. Exactly. I thought that was yeah. a bit cheesy. <laughs> you know, a guy who's gone through the horrors of war and escaped to another country. And then just because some young 15-year-old yeah. or whatever tells him, oh, you should have, you should fight mm -hmm. for tr truth and justice. Uh, well, okay. That. So... Yeah, so I agree with you because I, you know, if I, I'm gonna. That's the weird thing about this whole book, right? I, it's both playing with the tropes of this cheesy boys' adventure, but it still kind of wants it wants it both ways. Exactly. I was just going to say, um, it, there, my issues with it makes is that it, it a bit of an odd read as you read it as an adult, anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It it doesn't it doesn't really go beyond a lot of those tropes. And so while it is, while it is a, um, a well-written, a well-constructed world, obviously we, we've talked about that quite a bit, uh, the, the, the characterization, the characters, uh, the, 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 the whole story, the arc of the story, it all is well-constructed, but it doesn't go be much beyond just that basic story of an idealized young man going off to war and realizing the horrors of it. Right. And and while he is severely impacted by it in many many different ways, it doesn't really do anything else with it. Yeah. The, the, and and the saving grace, if if you'll pardon, because the 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 young lady that he uh, uh, ends up developing a relationship with is named Grace. Um, uh, yeah. uh, <laughs> the saving grace of this series to me is the Pacheco Marino art, a uh, uh, Sinclair art. I, I always want to include. Right. The color is too because it's there's, there's very distinctive color very distinctive yeah. color mm -hmm. and the color choices i think have a lot to do with some kind of idealized this is actually from the the new arc um sorry but for some sort of idealized uh past pulpy slightly pulpy past mm -hmm. uh, damien is is the new series is is it the same uh artist pacheco marino and sinclair I think it's a different inker, mm. but other than that, the same team. Oh no, I am wrong. It's not the same colorist. Okay, so the Jose Villa, Villa Robia is the new colorist. Okay, and he's following. Well, that's too bad that Alex Sinclair is not included, but he's following Alex Sinclair's lead. Mm, good. Um, but uh, but uh, I feel kind of sad that Alex Sinclair isn't part of it. Yeah, I think the the art team is absolutely fabulous in a yeah. very particular kind of style, right? Yeah. It's yeah. it 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 evokes classic illustration but is also an excellent comic book storytelling and and the and the coloring just gives it kind of a a patina of the past but also kind of a a beauty to it. Yes. Yes. I, so it I, does feel like you're looking at something from the past. Since since you're talking about that in particular, so there there are uh, there were a few issues that had letters pages when they were still doing those, um, and uh, right. so uh, there's a few things in here that I pulled out. Okay. Uh, of the various ones, you were just talking about the coloring. I wanted to ask you about this uh, specifically because in issue four, there's a letter where one writer complains that the colors are too rich. And need uh -huh. to be more down to earth. And I was curious what your response would be to that. I I sympathize with that because I often want coloring to be simpler. And this is probably 
in a period where they were just getting better at their computer coloring. Mm -hmm. You know, it was really horrible in the 90s. And some of the colorists, like Alex Sinclair, were kind of getting on top of it. But I bet that this looked better on your the two issues you read digitally. I bet the color looked even better there. Oh yeah, yeah. See, and that's one of the the tragedies so, of them not including those other issues is that you know I could I could look at them that way. Yeah. But but despite that, I mean, the, it, the coloring is, here is really it good. It's heavily on the page, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think I am I am getting used to modern coloring by now, <laughs> and so I think <laughs> this would have been harder on my eyes back then than it mm. is now. Mm -hmm. Um, it was a, it's a weird transition to the color is part of the visual language of the comics, right? And the, the visual language of the comics has changed mm. from say, you know, 19, 19, late 1980s to early 2000s. It's a big, big visual change. Well, you know, part of that is also the paper stock that, that, uh, that they transition to the more slicker sure. paper, which is, right. this is not, this is kind of like an intermediate intermediate. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Type of paper from right. from you know the stuff from that we we first started reading, yeah. uh, growing up to to what we have now. So, yeah, I could, I don't know. I I guess I I I disagreed with the letter writer. I thought mm -hmm. they were pretty down to earth. Um, yeah, I'm I mostly disagree with the letter writer, writer except I sympathize with with uh, him yeah. or her. Well, because I've gone through issues with color. It's it's such a it's such a um, interesting concept because you the coloring has to enhance uh, and or support or both the story that is being told and you know starting off with issue one like it, we keep, I keep using this word but you know the idealized outlook of Fletcher and his world it's it's so um, isolated and uh, you know the, the war is not in Colombia it's over across the ocean and so they don't they you know it's it's a very different coloring at the beginning of the series you know it's lighter brighter um, and, and then as you, as it transitions over to Europe things get darker and we have more night scenes you know and and uh, uh, some of the 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 contrasts of some of the scenes that and I'll talk about some of these later when we get into like if we're going to get into like particular issue things because there's a certain uh, art, artistic, and and storytelling aspects. That I want to I want to point out of this, but the the overlapping of one scene to another and how the coloring enhances that descent into darkness. I'll say, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Well, so for I have another criticism of it. I I think I it sounds like maybe I enjoyed this more than you did. Um, <laughs> I felt like I I thought it was very interesting how he was overlaying. The horrors of war with this boy's adventure story yeah mm -hmm. and i felt in a way in a lot of ways it was uh, a clever way to in theory seduce people into reading this story and then <laughs> making them realize how terrible war is yeah. do, do you think though that that really is what uh Busick and and pacheco are after is to uh, like some sort of uh veiled diatribe uh, that's anti-war or Something Either that, else. or or because they've studied history so much, at least an awareness of how in what an incredible meat grinder World yeah. War One was. Yeah, and of course yeah. World War Two was a meat grinder in another way. Yeah, but um, but I think they're not completely in control of that because I think he's too in love with the boy's story. Yes, the so he wants it both ways, and it's. It just, at least to an adult, I think it reads a little, a little flip floppy or, you know, not quite sticking to your guns of the yeah. horror of war. And definitely, I mean, I'm going to keep reading it, but uh, we return to kind of, uh, at least in the issue one of the new series of Behind Enemy Lines, of a slightly more idealistic world. Although he is a bit war weary. Hmm. A part of the issue takes place in England when he's kind of on a bit of a break from the front lines. And there's uh, the the problem between different classes in England and that kind of stuff. Oh, OK. So uh, shifting the focus of some of the socio-historical aspects, uh, examining right. those a little, bit, a, little right. a little more. Yeah. OK, but I don't know how deep he's going to go into that before we go into his behind right. enemy lines. He's obviously mm -hmm. going to be kind of a spy or something like that. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I like this a lot, but I, I sort of see that that there's something a little off 
in his different what seems to be his different intentions mm -hmm. and my, mm -hmm. but my bigger complaint like complaint like i think i would enjoy this a lot more if he dug a little deeper into the alternate history he leaves yeah. it so much in the background <laughs> that like i if i hadn't experienced reading a number of alternate history novels before and um and also um sort of picked up from reading the second the beginning of the second arc <laughs> picked up oh we're in alternate history everything's different there's no united states um i think i would have struggled with like what is going on here mm. in terms of that and now i'm really interested in the details of his alternate history but he's not giving us very much other than those maps and a few yeah. changed names um so he's got it all worked out in his head but but he's saving it for and it took him 20 years to get back to the story. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. So since we're on the topic, um, uh, there's a couple things that, uh, you know, cause like I mentioned the letters, the letter letters pages, right. music himself would, would respond to the letter writers, um, and also provide some, some other information along the way. But he, uh, in issue three's letter column, he talks about having over 20 pages of alternate history notes and even more on geographer, uh, geography. Um, he also mentions wanting to do prequel specials that will inform the history of the world. Uh -huh. And, and also doing, uh, he, he mentions later in one of the other, the later issues about doing other mini series set in this world. Right. So he had ve a very grand mm -hmm. idea. Mm -hmm. And there was also, um, did you get this also? An Damien? Astro City crossover yes. with Aerosmith? Yes. It, it wasn't a crossover, but it was a, uh, a special uh, to promote Astro City at that time and Aerosmith. Uh, oh, right. It was coming a out the same time. book that would yeah. have Aerosmith on one side and Astro City. And, and it was Astro include... City is why I was interested in this, because uh, I was mm -hmm. a huge Astro City fan. That, I'm sure that was another reason I, I got into it, too. I, I mentioned Avengers Forever, but yeah, Busick's Astro City was a huge reason why I, I wanted to read anything that Busick was writing. So did, did you happen to get that, uh, Astro city Aerosmith, um, uh, special? I don't think so. Okay. Unless it's somewhere buried in my boxes and I forgot that I had it. I, I actually ordered it, um, uh, after Just you recently? and I, oh uh, yeah. It, and uh -huh. it's, it's on its way. It hasn't oh, arrived yet. Okay. So it, it will, it will arrive next week, I suspect. And so too late for our, our talk, but, yeah. but uh, I'm really curious because it was, it was, he says, Busick says that. Um, the plan was to include more maps in that. So I'd be, right. I'd be uh, very, I'm very curious yeah. uh, what, uh, what we actually get out of that. I think in my, uh, my opinion, he should have included maps in every issue. I agree. He showed us a big map of Europe, but maybe we should have a zoomed in map of wherever the action's mm -hmm. taking place that time. Yeah. That would help us piece things together a bit. And um I don't know. A little bit more of the geopolitics of this imaginary world would really be mm -hmm. helpful. Mm -hmm. And uh, more hints at how magic changed things. Yes, that especially. You know? Yeah, Because that, that's... obviously he's figured out, way, now, I, now I know from you, way back to the Charlemagne's time, how magic would have shifted history around, mm -hmm. um, which is a great concept. I mean, I really like that. But, but he's, he hasn't put it on the page yet. Uh, you know, and to be fair, um, you know, he, they are trying to, at that time, 2003, uh, right. promote a comic book about a war that was, you know, a, a very long time ago, yes. <laughs> even at that point, um, uh, and uh, introducing this entirely new world and characters. And so there's only so much we, you know, they can fit into the, you know, 20, whatever, how many pages there true, are true. For, for six issues. And obviously, you know, while they got to tell their, their first story. Um, you know, uh, did it, did it not sell well enough to really, uh, keep the, the, the creative team going with, with other issues, uh, other stories. Maybe that way? was it. I can't remember now the ex I saw when they first announced that Aerosmith was coming back, some explanations. Mm. Oh, okay. Um, I missed that. So, uh, and I think with a image deal, they can, um, you don't have to sell as much for the mm. creators to make as much money. That's true. Because um, yeah. the creators get a bigger share of each each sale. How and and so there may have been an issue of getting the rights back from Wildstorm. It may have that taken a while to do that. Could be, yeah, yeah. Especially That's with true. DC in the mix, um, <laughs> you know, their corporate lawyers and such. 
There, there is uh, uh, Busick talks a lot in these letter columns. You know, another factor involved with this was was he wanted to work with Pacheco on the sequel or sequels, right? And Pacheco at that time was was becoming a hot commodity, mm-hmm. and he was being pulled off in these different directions. Uh, uh, one of those things he mentions a couple of times in the letters. You know, Pacheco was off doing an arc on uh, Superman, Batman at the time that I, I, I got those issues. And I, uh-huh. you know, again, I was like, oh, this guy is so good. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So if, if you're doing a project, that's just one artist and that artist has other things to do, you're, mm-hmm. um, but so, all uh, to be mean about Mr. Busick, cause I love his writing. Um, I love Astro city and I loved, um, Oh shoot! What was it called? It was first called Tooth and Claw, and then they had to change the name of it. Autumn Lands. Autumn Lands. So I was super into Autumn Lands. I bought I bought all the issues, and then I bought the trades, and then they just stopped. Yeah. And uh, he says that's coming back. Yep. So I think he has he makes plans that are too big. <laughs> and then he doesn't have the time and energy and his co-creators don't have the time and energy to complete mm. them. Mm-hmm. That could be. Um, that's, I think that's why Astro city remains his best thing because it's made up of lots of little short stories. And if there's a gap, you're not feeling like you're missing something like that's autumn land is going to be really hard for anybody to pick up on now. Mm. Um, and, uh, but the man has, I think he has more than most modern comic book writers and he's he's basically my age so a little older than you but um like me and probably like you has read a lot of fiction and is seeped in uh not in hollywood and video games and other comics but has re- along with he is seeped in comics obviously but has has read um ton you know tons of alternate history and jack vance and you know all kinds of stuff I I get I picked that up because I went to a column where he was talking about Autumn Lands and all the different influences that went into it, and that made me realize he's read a lot of the stuff that I've read over the years. Mm. Um, so and that's kind of that kind of makes uh, me relate to him more. Like part of what I relate to in um, my favorite comics is all the influences of other kind of pulp fiction and fiction kind of influences. Right, that are less of an influence now for mm-hmm. the younger writers. Mm-hmm. That's that's very true, and yeah, and you're not always. It's not always obvious that uh, the, mm-hmm. these are influences, but if if you have that background, if you have that experience reading those things, right, you can you can you can uh, pick up on those things a lot easier. And and in in Aerosmith, I feel like he paces the story more like novels I read as a kid than like. A typical comic book. Um, there aren't as many of those, you know, sudden reveals and um, a- other kind of little tricks that uh, comic book pacing has. It's more novelistic in its pacing. Yeah, it does. I, I could see it that. It skips time between each issue. So mm-hmm. um, uh, maybe a novel, there would be a few more chapters because you have more more space. Mm-hmm. But. Mm-hmm. But but at the for example, there uh, boy, which issue was that? Um, uh, issue the issue where they're going to Europe. Issue three, three where they're on the boat. Yes, that's the one. So uh, that ends. No, that's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> I have forgotten uh, which. Does one of them end in a more typical comic book cliffhanger? No, no, not a typical cliffhanger. Just, just the. There is a scene in one of the issues. Oh boy, this is bad, bad, uh, bad uh, video okay. and audio. You um, can edit anyway, it in the podcast. That's true. Smart. Um, so uh, uh, let me see if I can find it in my notes because uh, I'm not finding it in the going through the issues here. Yes. I'm sorry. It's issue one. <laughs> Always go back to your notes is the moral of the story. So uh, there's oh, yeah, here's one. Uh, the very last page of issue one. Um, he he and his friend Jonathan are they've they've uh, skipped town. They've run away to go join mm-hmm. uh, the Aero Corps. 
and we get this wonderful two pan uh, the, those final two panels we see the moon right. and you know they're he, they're on the train uh, heading to new york and he's like uh we're doing this because it needs to be done we're we're going to accomplish something going to make a difference in the world right. we're going to matter and then we see that final panel there that you're showing in the video of those those sprites hovering above all of the dead bodies with that same moon it's just those right. kinds of and there, there's another one like that where they're on the ship that i was trying to that i was originally thinking of basically he's saying something very similar about about mattering and making a difference and what we see is the dark murky sea that they've just thrown not thrown they've buried the body of their fallen comrade you know, mm -hmm. very similar ideas, but done right. differently. But you get these wonderful um, uh, uh, endings to the issues like this or endings to scenes yes. where it, it's not like the typical uh, uh, big reveal or page turn or whatever. But it is a nice way to. Um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, uh, it's transition to suppose. Well, definitely that, but 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 kind of uh, move from one issue to the other right. because we're not only moving through time and space uh, in the story, you know, right. just the ideas of this the transformation that Fletcher goes through. It's it's that what that scene that we're seeing right there in issue one is is basically the arc that we see him going through right. up to issue five. And you could not do this in a novel, perhaps. That's exactly your point. This is very so. This, yes, he does utilize techniques that only comics can do. Yeah, yeah. I think I was just well talking done. about the the pacing, the the sort of more deliberate than normal comic book pacing. It doesn't feel as much in a rush. That's true. And and it doesn't feel like it it relies on these page turn shocks. There's this kind of juxtaposition shock. Mm -hmm. There's the horror of war shock. Um, it's not at all. And Busek is a master of the comic book format, I think. Mm -hmm. So I didn't mean to imply that that he wasn't using comic book. Um, D Damien, do you techniques. think that, uh, part of our what we're butting up against here, our hmm, objection is too strong of a word, but uh, our reaction to this overall story and not not it not having as much I don't know impact on us is that we're so used to reading modern comics that that deliver stories in a certain way that is a little more um uh, perhaps action oriented or or you know the the, the bling they, they bring right. the bling to, <laughs> to the stories that we're not really getting here it's a it's just it's just a different way of telling a a comic book tale that we don't right. really see that often i don't think and that's maybe why i'm i give it uh i give it some extra space in mm. my head mm -hmm. it's it's trying to do something different I think he's going to, I think conceptually, it's always got to stay both the the old, old school boys adventure novel and the horrors of war, yeah. which is perhaps a limit, a limitation, um, which, but it, it's an interesting conceit or concept. It seems in a way in a vein of the kind of things Alan Moore was doing around this same mm. time, you know, with Tom Strong and... Um, and uh, uh, top 10 and those kinds of things where he had a kind of concept of a type of story and then he used it as a framework to play with the medium. Yes. I, I don't think uh, Alan Moore in those particular comics wanted to get into as heavy stuff as, as this does. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, so even though to me it's, it's a limitation, I'm still excited to read more. And oh, I yeah. think it's just interesting that he had this whole concept of a of a different way to to tackle both these kinds of stories. Mm -hmm. um, he's an old fashioned kind of guy in certain ways, and then an innovative comic book writer in other ways. <laughs> and I think that's I think that's kind of cool. But I don't think I have a feeling I'll never love this as much as I do Astro City. Oh yeah, yeah, I can, I, I totally agree with that. <laughs> But the Pacheco art helps a lot. It, yeah. Uh, yes. Um, uh, one of the things about that, uh, did, I, did I already talk about this, Damien? Uh, the way that he draws faces in particular, mm -hmm. how his eyes, his eyes. A lot of comic book artists cannot do eyes very well. <laughs> 
Um, but uh, the, the 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 faces are so expressive. I earlier on I showed in the video uh, that, that and Damien's showing it right now that you know the the uh, Fletcher and his friends there, and and how excited Fletcher is in that panel. And there's some other ones where uh, even on that very first page of that first issue, Damien. The sh showing the soldiers reacting to the pixies or whatever they're called. Um, uh, right, the very beginning of the book shows us some horror of war and shows us that it's a magical war, I guess. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. From from page one, we are we are introduced to the whole idea that this is not your your typical World War One story. Um, right. But but yeah, it just the, yeah that the. I don't know if people can see that in the video, but the 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 look of that soldier there in that middle panel, you know, just the, the beautifully drawn face and and how expressive his eyes and how he's like, "What? Well, look at this! This is this is incredible!" Right. And then you turn the page, it's like, "Oh no, it's not so incredible." <laughs> the moment of joy before he gets killed. Ah, uh, yeah, such such wonderful work. Yeah. Oh oh, and um, uh, there is in issue one there is that two page spread showing Fletcher's town. Where we get to see, you know, what wonderfully constructed by Pacheco, uh, seeing this this 1915 town and the the feel of it, the construction of oh, the buildings, yes, yeah, that's and beautiful. then then there uh, in issue issue five, is it the atrocity issue? We get the exact same two page layout of Holbrook, that the town that is that is firebombed by our heroes. Um, and it's, it's exactly the same. Um, obviously the buildings are different. This, the locale is different, but the, is that in five, I'm only seeing individual, is it after it's destroyed? So maybe it's an issue six. Oh no, there it is. There it is. I see what you're saying. Yeah. So we're getting the, yep. There we go. Well, for lack of a better word, the American city, American town, mm -hmm. and then the European town. Yeah. I, I just, I, love how yeah you you've got them overlap there that's wonderful um the the showing the two sides of war the the two sides of the story uh but done exact almost exactly the same way from you know from the layout perspective so right just those little bits are just wonderful emphasizing the people people have lives everywhere that aren't mm -hmm. that dissimilar but then it all gets destroyed and let me see, is it issue six? That's what's left. <laughs> yes. That's what war does to life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that destruction is just horrific. It's weird, but while I was reading this, I couldn't help but thinking about people we see on the news who talk about maybe they should pull out their guns because they're not happy with the way an election went. Mm. And... Uh, do they want this as a result of their unhappiness about an election? Uh, bad choice in my mind. Mm. Um, but I won't get any more political than that. But, um, <laughs> you know, you're making me appreciate even more what Pacheco's doing here because I didn't, I didn't catch that parallel. And uh, when you pointed out with the the moon where he was sleeping on the train, and then the moon over uh, a battlefield. He does a lot of nice parallels here. Mm -hmm. I was thinking when you were talking about uh, facial exp oops, wrong issue now, facial expressions, that he does a fantastic job of showing Fletcher grow up. That's oh yeah yeah. So here he is, you know, just the idealistic kid, and then even by issue two, when he's been going through some just preliminary training, he's the same person, but it's just. The whole way that uh, Pacheco does his expressions and his way of holding himself has changed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then it, it changed. I don't know if I have as good an example later on, but um, it, it continues to change throughout the comic sort of all done with just a few lines. You know, that's that's the great art of it. It's not like he does super detailed faces. Yeah, that's Oops, this, that is, is that is the most incredible aspect of that is that it's there's not much to it in terms of the construction of the art. And right. yet it is so evocative. I, I yeah. you know, part of that is, of course, um, uh, I think the coloring plays a, a coloring a plays a role, part. too. But there's like so, just the way he's tilting his head here when he was in the younger phase, he would never have been 
the weight of the world is holding him down. Yeah, yes. Pacheco has really, really thought of yes of these characters and what the physicality of that psychological stuff would be. Yeah, it it, it is rare for me to think in terms of a, a comic book in terms of the art being the larger um, part of of this of this of the comic book itself mm -hmm. it, usually i focus on the words and what the characters are saying and the overall kind of story uh that happens um all of that of course is is all tied together because you know art is part of that but right. it's, it's in this particular series though it may it really jumped out at me how much uh, this series works because of Pacheco and Marino and Sinclair. Right. We, you know, it, it makes me realize he's, a, he's not just a great illustrator or a great artist. He's a great comic book storyteller. Yes. And the, the art is telling so much. And I think that's what, I, when I don't, when I read certain comics and I, they just don't have any effect on me. I think it's often because the artist is not carrying all that extra weight that mm. someone like Pacheco is carrying. Yeah, perhaps. Yeah. But um, I mean, the the writer could be also at fault, of course. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, I think I think uh, the I, I personally think in most cases the writer the artist is carrying more of the the real weight. Um, mm -hmm. and it, it may or may not have been inspired by the writer. The writer may be sort of the root and then the, and then the artist is the whole tree <laughs> or something. <laughs> so, um, I'm, I'm a great worshiper of great comic book artists. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And well, I really appreciate you helping me appreciate Pacheco better. Here. Well, okay. So, uh, again, going back to the letters, since we're, since you just said that, uh, one of the writers, uh, in issue three, in the letter page, yeah, mm -hmm. compared the emotional impact of the art to Steve Ditko, Jack Kirby. What do you wow. think about that? It's a hard to make a one to one comparison because mm. those guys are are the ultimate shapers of uh, of superhero art, and this is not at all superhero art, right? Yeah, um. I when looking at this, I'm thinking more about uh, the tradition of Alex Raymond and Hal Foster, ah. and and then taken into a modern context and a, a more sophisticated psychology. Although I think if you look at Hal Foster, you'll see a lot of the characterization done in similarly by the positioning of the characters and the like. Mm. But Hal Foster never leaves that realm of boys' adventure. Um, or not very much <laughs> in, in, to the extent that I, I have a few, uh, Prince Valiant books. Um, I, I used to love reading Prince Valiant in the Sunday papers mm -hmm. when, I, when I was a kid. And, and Hal Foster and, and, uh, Alex Raymond were huge influences on generations of comic book artists. But, uh, but I feel like Ditko and, and Kirby would be the ones who broke past that in a mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. and created a new vocabulary for the at the time more modern superhero comics yeah 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 i i, I think the the uh the letter writer is maybe making too much of, right <laughs> of the art not not to take away obviously because we yeah. love pacheco's art here but right well he he's a uh, he's a great artist and i i actually have not been very aware of him i mean i vaguely got splashes of pacheco here and there but i did not read his avengers and I don't know if I, I read, I don't think I read that Batman Superman. Mm. I remember reading some Busiek Superman in my random forays into comic book stores. Mm -hmm. And those I would pick up and maybe because I, I still thought I could just pick up random comics and pick up on the story. Um, I didn't get much out of them. And so I thought <laughs> I concluded that I really didn't like Busiek's uh, work on, on the, uh, commercial properties mm. the license mm -hmm. you know not license but you know what i mean the uh, right big two properties right right well it, it's since you mentioned that uh because i i was like uh, before we got on here I, I, I looked up my collection to see well what other pacheco stuff do do mm -hmm. i have do, do i have more than just avengers forever and and this and i i do um but one of the things that they 
they came uh, back together and collaborated on was the uh, Trinity series from DC Comics uh, from 2008. And so Pacheco did the the art for the first six issues and then and then a smattering of the other because this is one right. of those 52 issue series, right. you know, a weekly comic book that DC put out for a while. I should I should look for that. I mean, part of the problem with me and reading Busiek on characters like Superman was, like I said, I didn't, I hadn't yet grokked the fact that all comics now came in six issue arcs. And mm. if you just, I was still reading it like I was in the eighties, <laughs> right? Where right. you could pick up an issue and just have fun. You they mm -hmm. would fill you in on what's going on, and and you didn't even have to read the next issue. Yeah, um, I kind of miss those. <laughs> Yeah. So, I mean, I, I had realized you had to do that with Vertigo books, but I didn't realize you had to do it with Superman books at that mm, point. Mm -hmm. um, all of that has pluses and minuses, I guess. <laughs> it would be weird. It would be weird to pick, pick this up in the middle. I mean, I think, Oh yeah. It's all about the arc that, that the character in the story takes. Yes. And, and that makes me um, really interested on what the next arc character arc, I mean, uh, mm -hmm. that Fletcher goes through in this new series. Yeah, and that's, at the moment, hard to say. Where did my... I can't even find the... Oh, well. Oh, here, I put it over here. Yeah, it's hard to say what what uh, Busiek is, is going for from this first issue. Because, again, he's he's very not plotting but he's just moving along at the pace he's moving along at mm -hmm. and he's not um in any big obvious way teasing what's coming next ah okay so it sounds like he's uh writing from the same playbook that he he built for the first series right so i think reading it you have to go into it not just accepting the fact that he's going to continue using the the boys pulp formula mm -hmm. as the overlay um i wonder what happened I, he meets up with rocky I, i'm not spoiling too much here now, there's not a lot to spoil about this issue anyway he meets up with rocky but i don't i now i have to reread it now because i read it before reading those six and see if they even talk about grace mm. i think they might mention her briefly the other thing is in, in the back matter here, he says originally he wrote this as a novel. Really? And something caused it not to get published. So now they're turning it into a comic. Oh, see, I could totally see this working as, as a series of novels as well. Right. Uh, you know, considering the, the whole alternate history thing of, of Aerosmith to begin with uh, and having, like I said, having read right. the, the six issues, it made me want to read more alternate history uh, novels, right. you know, by other people. And, and, uh, and then, so that was the, that was the next thing I was going to do is go figure out who should I read? Should I start yeah. with Watt Evans? Should I go somewhere <laughs> else? So, yeah. Yeah. So I think he pictured this as kind of a tapestry of his world with mm -hmm. all these different pieces. The only problem with that is, is underlying it is the horror of war. And so the fun of looking at all the pieces of this alternate history but we've already got the big point in this first six issues. Right. War war is just way more horrible than than anybody going into it imagines. Yeah, and see that's why I was asking uh you know what is this character arc that Fletcher goes on with this series, this new series yeah. because boy when you once you tackle the whole idea of war as hell and and its impact on on individuals uh what where do you go from there? Right. <laughs> I'm now guessing because it's called Behind Enemy Lines, we may be getting much more of a view eventually, not in this first issue at all, of what's going on behind, you know, oh. in the Prussian lines. Well, and and I uh, and in Prussian it, society, perhaps I don't know. This is I don't think this is a spoiler either, because I think he's Busiek has said that, said this or said as much in the lead up to this new series, but um, he gets taken prisoner uh, by ah. uh, by the the. The Prussians, and so he has to endure being a prisoner of war and what that does to him. Right. So that's a new way of a new, another. There's many aspects of the horror of war. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
and it's it's planned to be 12 issues so oh i didn't realize that. that's another reason perhaps why not a whole lot is revealed in the first issue mm. it's it's kind of you know since the bulk of it takes place back in england where they're not quite on r and r but but they're uh taking time away from the front lines before he's sent off on this special mission so anyway i think it's a it's a fascinating and unusual comic book then and now i think yeah still i so you know it holds up in that way because it's it's different from much of everything else on the stands yeah i i mean again he's imagining busiek is imagining after he does this 12 issue series they're going to do a whole bunch more but i'm just going to wait for him them to finish the 12 issue series and not worry about if <laughs> right <gonna> do more. <laughs> right <laughs> has has um has Pacheco been doing anything recently in other comics? Because I just don't yeah, recall I, seeing his name around. I actually looked that up when I was looking him up in terms of my own collection. And uh, it looks like he does a lot of covers. Mm -hmm. uh, or he's, he's, you know, he's done a lot of covers over the years. Um, I don't, I couldn't find, other than the new Aerosmith series, I couldn't find anything recent. I'm sure I'm missing something. So, yeah. you know, your your viewers and our listeners... Uh, maybe they can let us know, but I, I couldn't find anything besides his cover work. Uh, yeah. since, since 2015, the last thing that I have in my collection that he worked on in terms of the interiors was a squadron Supreme miniseries that huh. Marvel put out, uh, at, at that time. So, right. you know, but that's, well, I that's, hope that's they make a lot of ago. money from this, the individual creators mm. and that, that it keeps them going on it. Yeah. Yeah. And anything to keep, you know, Carlos Pacheco doing interiors. Yes. The covers I, are beautiful, but to me, the interiors are always the really important thing. Yeah, I I, I do not understand why he's not uh, a bigger commodity in doing stuff. And may, or maybe maybe he is in other areas. Maybe he's doing stuff. Uh, For Hollywood you know, or something. Who knows? Yeah, yeah. yeah uh, you know, maybe European comics or something. I don't know. So. True, true. Yeah. Yeah, it, I, he does live in Spain. I think that was mentioned in one of these uh, back matters. And he and I think it said he and his inker, although he has a different inker now. Um, oh, there's the cover for issue two. So, well, this was really great. Um, I think we've we're talked out on it. I, I think so. I, yeah. I have I had I had a bunch of other things, but it doesn't really matter yeah. that. Well, we if you have do anything that. to throw out, I'm. No, 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 no. That I I think we've we've pretty much covered uh -huh. everything through yeah. the the gamut of of what Aerosmith was. I I really enjoyed it, uh, despite my my nitpickiness uh, of certain mm -hmm. aspects of it. Uh, I can't wait to when this is when Aerosmith uh, Volume One, the trade collection hits the stands. I'll be I'll be getting that uh -huh. and reading it. So I think it's coming out in a hardcover. Ooh, even better. <laughs> Let's see. There's an ad for it here. Uh, Already? It wow. It was supposed to come out this month, but because of all the delays in the supply chain, it didn't. Oh, oh, you mean you mean the first volume? The sorry, the first volume. It okay. looks like a hardcover in the picture. Yeah. It doesn't say. Yeah, I, yeah, they're now right. saying April 2022. Okay. Well, there you go. Um, so you're the first I don't know. This. I don't know if it will be oversized. I think I would buy it if it's la a larger size. Mm. But if it's just the same size as the comic book, I already have the comics and they're a good way to look at the art. Yep. Um, yeah, I don't know that a, a normal size yeah, collection, like you say, would would enhance the reading. But but you get you get the issues all collected. So right. um, I don't know how scarce these these issues are. It was pretty easy for me to get those six issues. Right. I don't think they cost me very much. There wasn't much buzz left around around this series. So. But but that was before the announcement. Right. So. <laughs> right. It may now be harder. Yeah. I also wonder if once Image puts out this hardback, if there'll be a sort of digital trade available, mm. which tempts me to just look at Pacheco's art on the, uh, look at the coloring, especially yeah. in a digital format. Perhaps, perhaps I can get it through my library digital app, uh, Hoopla. I don't know if your library has that one. No, unfortunately um, not. A lot of image does show up there, oh. but I need to move Damien. <laughs> yes. You need to move to Portland. First, we, first we're going to lower the housing prices for you and then you can move. 
if you could do that, that'd be great. <laughs> I, I, this is totally off topic now, but I just, I moan and groan as I see the prices zooming up. Um, the last, like a number, a few, like, maybe two years ago, I was looking at the average home price in Portland and it was in the low 400 thousands. Oh boy. And my wife told me that she just read it's uh, the average price in Portland now is five seventy. Oh well, definitely not moving there. It's like <laughs> who can move here? I uh, who is buying these houses? And I don't want these people who can afford these kind of houses. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, that, this is one of the things that uh, I had in my notes that I, I wasn't going to bring up. But since you just uh -huh. talked about that, one of the things, I, I, as a joke, you and I, mm -hmm. I think, would get this. I don't know if uh, people outside of our our ge geographical area may not, right. but um, uh, in the um, the uh, North American map that we see in issue two, we are clearly in the California, uh, state or uh. you know, region or whatever it is. Right. And so now we're Californians, <laughs> right. We're Californians. <laughs> and is and, and, Deseret, is that Utah? I, I think that's the Mormon, uh, enclave area. Right. Yeah. And then Texas is all over the place. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and just, just so people know, um, uh, for people that live in the Pacific Northwest or the inland Northwest, as I do, uh, there's ever since I was a kid, it's always been <laughs> Californians moving in and, and making things worse. And I, yes. I don't just, I don't subscribe to that, but I thought it was funny that we are now in, at least in, in the Aerosmith land, we are Californians, Damien. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. And that's been the way ever since I moved to Oregon, California, I was glad I moved from somewhere, not California to <laughs> right. <Oregon. laughs> But um, but it is a fact that Californians often they've sold their million dollar house mm -hmm. in California and then they say, oh, wow, things are so cheap here in Idaho. Let's buy a giant house. Right. And drive up the prices for Eric. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a Californian plot. Yes. Um, yeah. So you've you've been putting out a lot of audio lately. I just listened to you, what was it, reviewing your comics from December? Mm -hmm. And then you had a gutters out very shortly thereafter. Right. Um, the gutters, for people who don't know, is when Eric talks about the rest of his life outside of comics, yeah. in between the panels. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah I, I've been doing a series of, for the last uh, little more than a year, a uh, pull list review where I just talk about all the comics I've read during a month. Right. Uh, I'll be doing one of those uh, again very soon, and um, uh, another another series of episodes where I, I, I do news, comic book news, mm -hmm. uh, touch on a few, very few things on previews that I want to spotlight, and then some whatever other spotlight thing I want to do, right. like creators or in the case of the next one I'm doing, it'll be my favorite, my top five favorite comic books of 2021, and then of course the gutters and and um, right. uh, the Legion and you project. You have your Legion project, which comes out what about once a month? Every staff ish, or ish yeah. <laughs> with when with it, uh, done with Peter Rios, mm -hmm. um, so a great show for hardcore Legion fans. Yep, yep. I usually listen to the first fifteen minutes, and then say to myself, "Well, I'm going to come back to this when I read all these Legion <laughs> issues." <laughs> that's but, uh, that's a, that's a way that's a way to do it. As long as you come I, back, I have hopes of coming back. <laughs> We'll, we'll um, be there when you do. And I, I still keenly await when you guys finally review the uh, Bendis Legion run. Ah, that I just want to hear your experienced <laughs> view on that. That is coming up, actually. Uh, in, oh, in cool, the next, cool. The next several months sometime in there. Okay. And uh, and are you getting his new Legion versus Justice League? We are. Yep, uh -huh. yep. We'll, well, I'm sure we'll talk about that eventually, too, once right. once the, once all six issues are out. And you have Center Seat, your Star Trek series. <laughs> my, uh, my, which maybe my, you've slowed down on that a bit. I, I yeah, I need to get back to that every now and then. Yep. You've got I, too many things going on. I, so. I do, I do, I do. Uh, I got to stop doing that. <laughs> and I think the great thing about the gutters is if you've been listening to them for a while, they get more and more compelling because you've been following Eric's life <laughs> over a series of months or years, perhaps. <laughs> 
That's very kind of you to say. <laughs> like the birth of your granddaughter and then the birth of a, was it a grandson the next yep. time? Mm -hmm. And, you know, the struggles to go visit them uh, during COVID. And, right. you know, you talked about your, your biking accident. And so <laughs> it builds up the drama. It's like a long-term comic book. Uh, it's, it's a, it's a horrible soap opera is what it is. <laughs> Someday to be drawn by uh, Pacheco. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. Wouldn't that, wouldn't that be something? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Well, I think I'll, uh, close out the broadcast and uh, I think we've pretty much covered what you do on your podcast. Mm -hmm. yep. um, and of course there'll be a link down below to the, to the podcast webpage. And sometimes yeah. you put extra material on the web page too, like uh, reviews of uh, the book 52, mm -hmm. issue by that was, issue. That was my latest one, yeah. So, uh, so yeah, people should both listen to the podcast and check out your, uh, I guess it's a blog. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to catch everyone else. I hope you're having a, everyone else the next time. I hope you're having a good uh, comic book reading week. And we'll talk later. Bye-bye.